What's going on, guys? Angry Larry here with the Armbar WWE Draft Recap Show. What a night it was. I thought it was awesome. I'll break it down in just a second. Let's take a look here at the draft by the numbers. I put together these stats. I hope they're correct. They mostly are. I may have missed a, uh, a number or two, but for the most part, I'm 98% sure they're correct. Breaking it down, we know Raw had more draft picks overall. In fact, the first seven rounds, I believe, were one pick additional for Raw than SmackDown. So Raw had 33 total picks, while SmackDown had 26. Total wrestlers, Raw got 40 wrestlers, SmackDown 31. Six tag teams wound up on Raw, five on SmackDown. Seven women on Raw, five on SmackDown. And for NXT, Raw got two of the NXT picks. SmackDown got four of them. Now, a lot of people were speculating that SmackDown were going to be the younger show, the newer talent. But looking at these numbers, it is, in fact, by a small margin, the younger show. 34.1 is the average age on Monday Night Raw. 32.2 on SmackDown. But you have to... Acknowledge the fact that on Raw, you have Truth and Goldust to average about, not average, but their combined years are 91, 91 years old combined. Uh, New Day are 93 combined, so that's kind of young for, for comparison. It's it's drastically younger than the Golden Truth, but you also have um, the Dudleys, you know, combined age of 88 years old. The Shining Star is 67 years old, and Mark Henry's 45, and Titus O'Neil's 39, Big Show's 44. So you have a lot of older guys that drive this number up, but they only drive it up a little bit. So it's not really the younger show. In fact, it's pretty balanced, and it's balanced across the board, and I think the draft did a good job this way. So let's talk about the presentation of the draft, first of all. I thought it was amazing, really. Uh, the second screen experience was really good. In fact, I muted the TV at times just to raise the volume on my iPad to hear some of the interviews that were going on during the matches. Uh, more specifically, Chris Jericho, Kevin Owens, Enzo and Cass when they interrupted Kevin Owens, The New Day, and the, the social outcast segments were, were great. On the TV side of things, the one actual commercial break in the middle of the um, Gallows and Cena match, they did a IndyCar, NASCAR, side-by-side -side style um, breakdown, split screen, let's say, where they still showed you the live action in the ring, but they showed the commercials and had the audio for the commercials instead. I don't know why they didn't do that during the main event, but if that's a thing going forward... And, like, the sponsors are on board with it. Uh, it could make, like, it could be unique to SmackDown, but it could make wrestling in general better for everybody. They do so many commercials during the, during matches now. And have those, you know, stay tuned for the conclusion of the match and, and, and calculate where they're going to put the commercials. I tend to drift to other programming. Monday Night Football, if it's in season. Uh... You know, baseball, stuff like that. Uh, Monday night, I go to Parks and Rec. On on Thursday night during SmackDown, I go to Bob's Burgers and whatever, you know, sporting events on at the time. Ninja Warrior is always on TV, so I'm always going back and forth. Basically, whatever doesn't have a commercial is where I'm going. And then I come back to Raw or SmackDown whenever, like, it's time for it to come on. Or unless what I switch to is more entertaining than the match that was going on. So they can lose me for a couple segments or... or ins and outs of segments side by side might keep me and others on the channel because something's always going on you know nothing happens during a commercial break but with side by side it could not saying it would but it could and for people who just want to watch wrestling it's why not you know, especially if everyone's on board with it. So so I like that. I didn't know why it wasn't in the main event, but it was interesting. They did at least the one segment. Now, I, I was a little confused near the end because they kept saying 30 more picks, 30 more picks. And, and at the, the way they were doing it, the structure of the draft 
which they also did a great job explaining it, posting it beforehand, posting a list of wrestlers that were expected. So you, there wasn't anything hokey or corny going on. Like the Native American Tatanka wasn't drafted. Haxo Jim Duggan wasn't drafted. You know, Pete Rose wasn't drafted or Mike Tyson. They did a legitimate job treating it like a sport. And all the credit goes to them for, for, for doing it that way. But at the end, when they kept saying 30 picks are left, based on the format that Erie had, with Raw having three picks and SmackDown having two picks per round, it got a little confusing at the end, especially when they were steamrolling through picks in between interviews on the after the 10 o'clock hour on the East Coast when it went to the, the network only. There was only one more round with five picks. And then after that, every round had three picks aside for a total of 29 more picks. And as we know, Heath Slater was the odd man out because the list that they had had 60 people on it. Uh, 60 individuals. And I, I think I got that number wrong. Hold on one second. Um, 60, no, 11... Well, whatever it was, however many rounds they had or were going to have, uh, it matched up perfectly. It, 60 is not the number. It's um, it's something different. But whatever it is, it matched up perfectly, especially when you took a three-person tag team like the Social Outcasts and you split them up. Then it was right on the nose. If every other tag team didn't get split up and the Social Outcasts got split up, which, based on their pre-show interview you kind of thought was going to happen. Everything made sense. And then they switched it to six picks per round instead of five, shortened the round by one round, and then you had that extra pick being left off, the remainder, and it was Heath Slater. The gripe I had about w, uh, the draft uh, at the start from the first pick was there was no green room. Like the drafts in the past or an NBA or an NFL draft. And, and for those who don't know, a green room would be like all the draftees would be in the room. And then as their names were called, as they were drafted, they'd leave the room. They'd go, they'd get their mock, you know, makeshift uniform, wear the hat, smile, take a picture with the commissioner, stuff like that. In the pre-show, they showed like a top 10 shocking moments at the draft. And a lot of them had had green room like segments where all the wrestlers were in the same room reacting to them getting picked like the Dudley boys getting split up or uh, Triple H being uh, switched from Raw to, to Smackdown and stuff like that. That's nice. I would have liked to see it and I would like to see them come out and, and accept their t-shirt. It's a lot of time to do stuff like that. A lot of additional time. I, I just I wish they would have found a way to make it happen but that's really not so much a complaint anymore because I got my green room at the end of the segment when Heath Slater was alone in the room. The last one left that, that, that embarrassing spot where there's a quarterback left who hasn't been taken yet. And he's the only one in the green room and they keep showing the picture of him still there. He's still there. He's still not taken. And the lights go out on Heath Slater because the show is over. I was awesome, especially with all the interviews they did. Uh, beforehand, I loved it, and uh, I don't think it's a a knock on Heath Slater. I don't think they disrespected him. I think that it's all in good fun, and and, and in a draft, and I'm going to allude to this later, where they're drafting in a predetermined outcome anyway. Why not have some fun with it? And they could run with it, and I'll speculate on that in a little bit. So, so I I like I enjoyed that a lot. I think they also missed an opportunity when um, they picked the golden truth on the WWE Network side of things after SmackDown went off the air. Uh, picking golden truth live would have been awesome, especially if R-Truth came out to accept a Slammy and, and he thought it was for the Slammies or if he thought it was the Royal Rumble and he ran to the ring and you know maybe tried to throw out Kane or, or whatever, whoever would have been in the ring at the time, let's say. Uh, it could have been a nice little comedy spot there as well. It would have been would have been funny. Would have gotten cheap pops. So um, the last thing that really, um, it didn't anger me. There was no angry Larry this time. I was pretty cordial. 
the performance center and i might have missed the segment here going back and forth between looking at my ipad for the wwe network side of things and and watching it on live on tv when finn balor was picked they interviewed him on the network in the performance center which was great all the wrestlers were from the nxt were in the background it, it was it was good it was cool and I don't think they did it for American Alpha, although I might have missed it. I did kind of screw up. I was kind of taking notes on top of the iPad. And I may or may not have rewound the WWE Network and, and not have been watching it live. So I may have missed them going back to the Performance Center to interview American Alpha. And if I did, I'm sorry. But it appeared to me that they only went there once. One time. Uh, and every other pick thereafter, and, and Nia Jax as well, I may have missed. But every other pick thereafter, the other three picks of the six picks were done on the WWE Network side. And I know for a fact they didn't go to the Performance Center there. So unless I missed it, I don't think it happened. But I kept good tabs on it. But, you know, someone will correct me. Let me know because I will go back and, and take a look at it. I thought they were there anyway, so it would have been cool if they did more there. So... So here we go. We're going to analyze the draft right now. We're not going to go pick by pick. We're not going to go round by round. Um, and I'm not really necessarily going to argue who was picked before who and who should have went higher than they than they did uh, too much. I realized that at, the, at its core, like I said, uh, it's a draft around the business that's predetermined. So anyone could have got gone anywhere in any order to any show. It, it, they got to their desired result in the end. And then they, they presented it in a, in a certain way. But but a, you know, phenomenal job by Shane, Stephanie, Mick Foley, Daniel Bryan, and the WWE Network announced team, Renee, Young, Lita, Booker T, Corey Graves. Uh, they did a great job treating this like a real sports draft. It, 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 was, it was tightly formatted. It was concise. The rules were laid out, like I explained before. It was a great event. It wasn't corny. And um, it was legitimate. And I, I really enjoyed it for what it was. And, and really did not expect it to be that entertaining and that professional. So thank you, WWE, for that. But with all that said, here are who I think won and lost. And a few other gripes, but but not, not much. I already touched on the R-Truth thing. Roman Reigns being drafted in the second round, sixth pick overall to Raw. Here's the thing. I believe that if Roman Reigns was not suspended, he would have been picked number three overall instead of Charlotte. I think they would have kept the shield together. Rollins, Ambrose, Roman Reigns, they're fighting at this pay-per-view. They're the shield. They're their top guys. They're the last three guys to have the heavyweight title. I think... The, the plan is not to separate them, to say that it's it's not 1, 2, and 3. It's 1A, 1B, and 1C. They could have gone in any order, but the suspension kind of ruined that. So they drop him to the second round because that's kind of like punishment. They promote Charlotte, who I still think would have went in the first round, but fifth overall. They promoted her to third overall, and they moved someone like Finn Balor up to, to the fifth pick in, in the first round. He might have been the sixth pick. He might have had Roman Reigns' spot, the sixth pick overall. Or he might have been taken later if Roman wasn't on suspension. Doesn't matter. The The overall point here is I think that Roman was was uh, punished a little bit for his, um, you know, mishap, let's say. But he owned it, so he didn't go to round three. He went to, he went to round two. Uh, speaking of Finn Balor, though, with AJ Styles on SmackDown and Finn Balor on Raw... With Gallows and Anderson, we could see Deja Vu in reverse here, if that's even a thing. Whereas AJ Styles took over the Bullet Club when he joined New Japan Pro Wrestling at the same event that Finn Balor was leaving New Japan Pro Wrestling. Finn Balor is going to be joining Raw at the same time AJ Styles is leaving the club to go to SmackDown. It could fit. The club could become the Balor Club. They already have the merch for it, you know, or they can just continue with the club. Uh, or it could not happen at all. But I, I think that everything's in place for for the debut of Finn Balor uh, and, and, and something for him as well. 
leading the club. Because I think that Gallows and Anderson, they're good, but I think with a leader and, and the, the historic reference to the Bullet Club, uh, the homage or the copy cat ripoff or whatever they want to, whatever you want to call it, I think it works. And I think that uh, it'd be even more fun if more members joined over time. And uh, hey, listen, it's not a bad spot for Finn Balor to be in. It's better than uh, being relegated to fighting the big show in Mark Henry every week. Which Braun Strowman probably is going to do since he was drafted to Raw and the rest of the available Wyatt family members were drafted to SmackDown. Uh, Luke Harper could join him. You know, he was injured, so he wasn't a part of the draft. When he comes back, he could join Braun Strowman. And maybe you can have a Wyatt club kind of spanning both uh, uh, factions, spanning both brands or an influence on both brands. Or Harper could just join the Wyatt family on SmackDown, recreate the original team. And um, Strowman is, like I said, left fighting Mark Henry and Big Show a hundred times over. Which is probably going to happen. And Lesnar's there too. I don't know how, how good a Lesnar-Braun Strowman match would be. Or if it even would happen at all. Is With how many few dates Brock Lesnar works for the company. But as long as it's not Big Show, Mark Henry, Strowman every single week. And then all of a sudden, Creative has nothing further for Braun Strowman. I'd rather see him fight other guys and not succeed more than I'd like to see him fight big guy over after big guy after big guy. And then all of a sudden, just, you know, fade out. Speaking of fading out, though, speaking of everything, I've got all these segues lined up. Duke would be so proud of me. Kalisto. Now, it's funny how, how, like, non-educated WWE fan thinks that Kalisto is Rey Mysterio Jr. or or did at one time. But now we found out Kalisto is really Sid Vicious. That interview was awesome. That was... I was almost ready for Kalisto to ask... Um, I, who was it? I think it was uh, Hamilton for a redo. To, to cut and re-, re... It was so good. You gotta watch that again. If you missed it, Find Kalisto's interview on the, um, the the post show, whatever they wanted to call it, the third hour or fourth hour of the draft special on the network. It was great. Furthermore, I am happy that the WWE kept couples together. I mean, it's kind of kind of kind of sweet, but and, and silly to even put this down. But based on WWE's past, where they have taken the draft and split up real life couples. I, I, people dating and stuff like that and put them on different shows. I, I'm glad they kept The Miz with Maurice, Rusev with Lana. Uh, that was predetermined. That was on the list of rules. They were drafted together. But Jimmy Uso and Naomi weren't necessarily drafted, needed to be drafted together, but they put them both on SmackDown. That was good. I'm happy that happened. Del Rio and Paige are on different shows. I'm not even sure if that's still the thing or if it's even real. But uh, there's always WWE Divas, so uh, or whatever, Total Divas. So they'll uh, still get together and do their stuff, I guess. Now, right now, if this was a major sports draft, we would have a segment that talks about people who were drafted higher than expected or lower than expected and not drafted at all. So this is the spot for that. Somebody who is drafted higher than expected for me... Nia Jax. She was taken in the fifth round, 25th pick overall. The Duke and I had an early morning conversation where we, where we each listed the six NX, NXT people that we thought were going to get drafted. He had Nia Jax, all credit to him. I didn't. Um, but she was publicly taken in this draft over Natalia, Paige, Naomi, and pretty much everyone else. That's not Charlotte, Sasha, and Becky Lynch. She was the fourth diva taken overall in the draft. And I'm checking that stat right now real quick. Just to make sure that I, I've i got it. Um, let's see. Charlotte, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Nia Jax is the fourth uh, diva taken. That's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. She even went before Cesaro. Now... This is the odd pick in everyone's fantasy football draft where someone takes this off-the-wall name, whether it's a rookie too early or some backup tight end or or a kicker 
not in the last round, and everyone just laughs or just goes, ah, you can have him, you know, or some silly joke like that. And that's not a discredit to Nia Jax, um, but it speaks more of out of how much out of left field that this pick was at the time, and that's not a bad thing. The, the draft is, like I said, and I'm going to say later on and, and probably a couple more times over, it is really meaningless, the order of the draft, more so than, than you know, getting to the desired result. But they really put Nia Jax up there. So I expect good things coming her way uh, if she can, you know, handle the workload and stuff like that and, and work in, on the bigger stage. And no reason why she couldn't. So, so good for her. Somebody who was taken way down the draft, and he kept he he was he was on the list. He's still on the list. He's still on the list. He's still on the list. And finally, he was taken ninth round, forty fifth overall, Apollo Cruz. He got the Jerry Rice on the Oakland Raiders treatment in this draft. For someone who had well, maybe not a Jerry Rice like career, but but my point is for somebody who was so hyped after WrestleMania and and, and just praised and, and the segments for him with with the look and the speed and the athleticism, the power um, for for this guy to be drafted after the Ascension, Jack Swagger, Summer Rae, that's like insulting. And, and again, it's silly to argue who was taken over who. Um, but, you know, since this isn't a draft where you have to prioritize a certain position or address a certain weakness in your team or, or stuff like that, you're just kind of drafting wrestlers and it really makes no difference if you're picking a singles wrestler or a tag team wrestler over, or over a women's wrestler in, in terms of order, but it's kind of insulting <laughs> to be presented on TV, you know, it, especially when like Summer Rae and Connor and Victor have not had the best careers in WWE and, and like have pretty much been off the radar for a year, more or less. And then you have this upstart guy that you were hyping and you're just kind of saying, ah, you know, we'll just make him picked after these guys, unless it's intentionally sleeping. And like I said, that's another reason why draft order doesn't matter. To, to then use it as a guy who's who's who fell in the draft and he as they explain on the WWE network he doesn't make a big fuss he's quiet he's not in your face and that's the reason why he fell so low and then to turn that around in, in a sort of angle and have him come out like a house of fire to prove something well then that's the reason why he was taken after summer ray and, and swagger and the ascension and, and all that so so Really, it's it's a contradictory argument, and it's an argument where no one wins, because you know it, it's you can't evaluate stuff like this. It, it's two brands drafting and not thirty-two teams drafting. So, if he's not on one show, he's on the other, and we they all can't be top three round picks. You know what I mean? So, so that's that. But um, how about people who weren't taken in the draft? And WWE, again, they put out the list of, of all those wrestlers, and one was not taken, Heath Slater. And it's funny, again, how that happened. Uh, him being a man with no home. He can't be with his best friends on Monday Night Raw. Maybe we get some segments where he tries to get in the building and security won't let him in. Maybe he has to dress as the Native American Tatanka or the Lethal Weapon Steve Blackman and try to get by security. Uh, it could be it could be fun. It can be funny. He can be nice nice segments. He could uh, cost Bo Dallas and and Curtis Axel max matches and eventually wind up feuding with them. It, it 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 it's not insulting to Heath Slater for that to happen. It's it's more opportunistic that it happened for future stuff down the line and potential segments. And everyone wants a segment on Raw, so he has that now. The only people who could have been undrafted because of the format would be on the NXT side. So you had guys like Samoa Joe, Nakamura, Austin Aries, Bobby Roode, The Revival, among many others, um, not drafted. But simply put, they can still debut at any time. 
But NXT still exists. And you need to have stars to make it the best it can be. So I'm not angry in the least that these guys did not get the call right now. NXT will remain better for it. Now, would I want Nakamura on the main stage? The main shows? The, the whatever they call it that's escaping my mind right now? The main roster? Yes, I would. Absolutely. I would want Aries there. I would want Samoa Joe there. I'd want Bobby Roode there. If they're there, then what are they doing? And then who's in NXT taking their spot? I think the balance was nice. And you got Mojo Rawley, who went to, you know, the main roster. He went to SmackDown. American Alpha went to SmackDown. Nia Jax went to Raw. Uh, Eva Marie, well, Eva Marie doesn't count. You know, Alexa Bliss and, and Carmella went to SmackDown. And then Raw got one other person uh, escaping my... Oh, Finn Balor. So... They did a nice job taking the talent who may not have been the best in their divisions, but talent nonetheless to put him in the main roster and leaving some stars in NXT. I think that's I think that's fine. Big fan of NXT. I don't want to see it watered down. I don't want to see it a constant breeding ground for the main roster. I like a little bit of long, longevity when people go there. And uh, certainly the main roster have gotten a lot more NXT talent this year than they had in the other years combined. So, and the year and the year is really just over halfway. So, so I'm happy about that. But here's the thing, and here's the thing that's going to um, anger a lot of people. Bailey did not get drafted. It makes no sense. But if she's Sasha Banks' mystery partner for the tag match at Battleground, then I'm happy she didn't get drafted. And why? Because I always love it when the debut happens out of nowhere. If Bailey was drafted and drafted to Raw, and it's known she's on a roster and she has a place, then it's easy to make that association that says she can be the mystery partner. But now that people did not see Bailey get drafted... Now where does their mind go? Who can it be? Maybe Bailey's out of their mind and they have to start thinking about, well, can it be Nia Jax? Well, they don't really have a have a working relationship. Could it be Alicia Fox? Well, maybe. Could it be Naomi? Well, she's on a different brand, but this is the last show that they're going to do besides the major shows that they have both uh, brands working together and against each other. So that's a possibility. They teamed up before. Bailey not drafting makes this a better surprise than if she was drafting is basically what I'm trying to say here. And also, going forward, if Bailey helps out Sasha in the tag match, well, what's to say she doesn't help out Sasha neutralize Dana Brooke if Sasha fights Charlotte in, at SummerSlam in the building where Sasha and Bailey tore the house down last year? It kind of comes full circle, even though it's not Sasha versus Bailey part three or part three after their incredible match. Kind of comes full circle. They're both together in the same area. One of them goes on top of on the main roster. It's a nice thing to happen. I think that's the way it's going to be. It writes itself, and sometimes it happens that way. Additionally, no NXT champions were selected, and that's good. Let the stories run their course instead of creating vacancies and, and loopholes and awarding titles or creating tournaments or competitions for them. That's fine. Now, last thing. Who won the draft? Who has the better divisions? It's a hard call because ignoring what show the titles were drafted to, Raw has an interesting world title picture. Rollins, Reigns, Lesnar, Jericho. Those guys have always been on top. Throw Finn Balor in the mix and add Kevin Owens. And then you also have former champions like the Big Show, Jack Swagger, Sheamus, and Mark Henry, who may all consider, be considered now to be not top talent, but still maybe could have a couple runs left in them if, if given the proper storyline. Cesaro could also be in the mix. Or he can be in the mix for the U.S. title, mid-card kind of section, with Kevin Owens. You also have Sami Zayn, Titus O'Neil, Bo, da Bo Dallas, and Rusev. Um, 
but I say Bo Dallas, hopefully, and Curtis Axel. Where it gets interesting on Raw is the Cruiserweight title, because I only see Neville as being a, a definitive Cruiserweight. Everyone else, you're kind of stretching the definition for. Uh, Sami Zayn probably qualifies underweight. He probably qualifies in style. Cesaro can be in there as well. But these are guys I'd like to see have more of a, a mid-card run to propel themselves higher than to come, not, not say necessarily come down, like demoted to Cruiserweight. But Cruiserweight could have been better left, like the WCW used to, to run it. High Flyer is more than just another mid-card title for a guy who makes weight. We'll have to see, because they're going to sign a lot of people from, uh, not a lot, of, they're going to sign a few people from the, the Cruiserweight Classic and, and NXT still yet to come. So what the Cruiserweight is now, today, the, the, the division is today, may not be what it is after SummerSlam and, and stuff like that. And who knows when they're going to debut that title and how they're going to debut it and what the roster will be like then. So we'll, we'll leave that to judgment. But the SmackDown world title pitcher, John Cena, AJ Styles, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, Bray Wyatt, former champions Ziggler, Del Rio, and Kane, that's not too bad. The Intercontinental title, Miz, Apollo Crews, Baron Corbin, Kalisto, Zack Ryder, eh, it's not terribly good, but if you bring Bray Wyatt down, if you bring Dolph Ziggler down to the Intercontinental title and, and, and give them runs with it or, or have them challenge for the title, it's not that bad. It really isn't. It's, it's not watered down. The draft didn't water down WWE kind of made it stronger. And, and that, that was the goal. Um, I think they're pretty pretty balanced. Both heavyweight divisions are solid. Both feature newish WWE talent, mainstays, forgotten talent, older talent. Uh, let's call this advantage Monday Night Raw, though, because they have the title, and it's the only title right now. So until they introduce the second title, if they introduce the second title, and I know the Duke has a theory on that, so make sure to check out the GNWC Battleground Preview Show. The link's in the description. It'll be uploaded this Thursday night to hear what he has to say and how he thinks both titles are going to be spawned, based, or how the other title is going to be spawned, basically. Mid-card card title advantage. I'm going to give it the SmackDown and Intercontinental title. Um, like I said, if you take Bray Wyatt and Ziggler and put them in the Intercontinental picture, um, I, I, I think that's better than the U.S. title, which could have... Owens in it, but can lose a lot of guys to, to the Cruiserweight title, depending on what they're going to do. Um, it's close, but let's go advantage SmackDown on this one. Tag teams are, are, are a little bit weird. Raw has the championship. They have the New Day, the champions. Enzo and Cass, the club, Golden Truth, the Dudleys, and the Shining Stars. A lot of experience, a lot of talent, a lot of championship runs between everybody, either if they were together or apart or whether they were in Japan or, or here. SmackDown has American Alpha, the Usos, the Ascension, Breezango, and the Void Villains. A couple NXT title runs there. Uh, three of them. So American Alpha, Ascension, and Void Villains will have the titles. Usos, multi-time WWE champion. I don't know. I, I, the obvious choice here is Raw. But SmackDown has the much younger teams. And if repackaged and presented differently, and if the Void Villains and the Ascensions, Ascension and Breezango were actually allowed to wrestle more than, like, you know, five-minute matches and, and, and actually made to look good, it could be closer. But uh, I honestly don't think it's close right now. Advantage Raw. Last but certainly not least, the women's division. Uh, clear... Clear as day, advantage Monday Night Raw. SmackDown has Becky Lynch, Natalia, Naomi, Alexa Bliss, Carmella, and uh, Eva Marie. Becky's awesome. Natalia has kind of fallen in my eyes as being like a legitimate, good technical res technical wrestler. Her multi matches with Charlotte this year, kind of like, you know, I was upset when she wasn't around for the the Divas Revolution. Uh, excited when she came back, but 
then just match after match with Charlotte. And uh, I just, I can't get into Natalia anymore right now. Uh, and I'm very uncertain on how Alexa Bliss and Carmella will do on the main roster. Um, I, I don't have confidence that they'll be as good as the girls who have been promoted before for them. Um, but I could be wrong and I want to be wrong. I don't want to hate them. I don't hate them. I want to see them succeed because I like wrestling in general. I don't want people to be bad. Uh, Raw has Charlotte and Sasha and that far and away, I think, blows SmackDown out of the water. They also have Nia Jax, Paige, Summer Rae, Alicia Fox, and Dana Brooke and the championship on that side. So I think um, Advantage Raw... Pretty much. <laughs> uh, as it stands right now, without any future call-ups or people returning from injuries or the inevitable trades that will happen that will balance the rosters and create different storylines where, where, where it's needed. Uh, it's my opinion that both shows have great heavyweight divisions. SmackDown has the better potential mid-card title roster, depending on how they split it up. And Raw has the better tag team and the women's division, and also the titles for those respective divisions, plus the Cruiserweight title and brand. I think that Monday Night Raw pretty much won the draft, but they might have done it with all those extra picks that they uh, that they received as well. So who knows how it would have went if it was two dudes, like me and the Duke, and we have a, a draft uh, prediction show that we did a couple weeks ago uh, that went up on uh, YouTube our YouTube channel, the GNWC. It's uh, linked below. If two dudes like us would predict it, the draft using the same rules, uh, we might have much different rosters. One person might go for youth and, and you know, athleticism over the other person who might go, like, experience and, and name recognition. But um, in the end, it's pretty much, uh, it's it's pretty even. But uh, advantage draw, and again, it might be because of the extra picks. Now, that's just my opinion. It's not really worth a whole lot. But I'm interested in what you guys think. Think, What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Who are the winners and losers from the draft? What did you like? What didn't you like? All that stuff. And most, uh, most importantly, what are you looking forward to the most? Let me know in the comments, or you can hit me up on Twitter, at LarryIsAngry. Also, make sure, again, to check out the official GNWC Game and Wrestling Connection Battleground Prediction Show. It's coming this Thursday night. The link is below. I am Angry Larry, and I'm begging you to get off my computer because it's like 300 degrees in my office, and I have swamp ass, and I got to put on the air conditioner. I got to go. Bye.